Greetings, knowledge-hungry hurly-burlyites. Here's an interesting piece of information for you, gleaned from my years as a quantitative researcher, also my personal ethnographic observation of how we live our lives. A hell of a lot of people have cell phones out there, mobile phones. Maybe you've seen them posting humorous online videos, texting while walking into the sides of buildings, ordering gluten-free, low-carb, paleo cauliflower pizza, and sometimes, sometimes even talking to loved ones. Actually, according to statistics, almost 34 million of us own a wireless device. A cell phone is just a necessity of modern life for almost everybody in this country. You've heard us talk on the pod about our presenting sponsor, TELUS, and their award-winning network. But did you know that Public Mobile, the prepaid wireless company, is also part of the TELUS family of brands, giving customers access to TELUS's expansive wireless network at the lowest possible price. It's just another way TELUS demonstrates their commitment to helping all Canadians access the digital tools and resources they need, all on a world-class network. Canadians seeking affordable plans are much more likely to opt for prepaid plans, not only because of attractive and predictable pricing, but also because they don't require credit checks. With plans starting as low as $15 a month and no contracts, Public Mobile offers Canadians the flexibility to choose a plan that suits their needs and price point without compromising on quality of service. To learn more, visit publicmobile.ca. All right, that takes care of the expenses in Jenny Burns' contract writer, Hurley Burleyites. It's time for the pod. For the first time since the onset of the COVID lockdown in mid-March, we have a one-part podcast on the Hurley Burley today, and that's our political panel. I'm actually on vacation this week, but that will not stop me from recording this podcast because, like a vacation, doing the poly panel with my friends is pretty much like sipping a glorious rum-based umbrella drink to me. Today on the panel, it's the aforementioned brilliant conservative political strategist, Jenny Byrne, whose contract writer stipulates that we buy her a thrift store Willie Nelson t-shirt every second week, <laughs> as well as make a modest donation to the Erecta Stephen Harper statue in the Writing of Papineau Fund. <laughs> <laughs> and coming back to the panel today, in this last week before the long-awaited return of Scott Reed, our favorite NDP pundit, who wears his flat-brimmed cap slightly askew, Chris Ball. Hello. We're gonna come. We're gonna cover Aaron O'Toole's first week as Conservative leader. How did it go? What does he need to do to get ready for a potential fall election? Has he already lost his SoCon support? And speaking of a fall election, this upcoming Reset Canada speech from the throne is this really a governing document or a campaign kickoff in disguise? We'll also talk about last week's Republican National Convention of what looks like a tightening race in the United States. And there's a New Brunswick election coming up in a couple of weeks. Um, and we'll, if we have time, take a look at COVID Canada, six months from the onset of the pandemic. Why isn't there still any rapid testing and meaningful contact tracing going on? Jenny and Chris, I'm so glad you're joining me on vacation today. Thank Hi. you for taking the time. Hello. Happy vacation, David. Thank you very much. It's not that distinguishable from my non-vacation up here at the lake, but it is somewhat. Uh, <laughs> Chris, how are you? I haven't talked to you in a few weeks. What have you been doing? Uh, I've been growing a mustache, so that's been taking a whole lot of time. Um, otherwise, A deliberate yes. decision? Why? Uh, Why? What, you know, what's behind this? I don't know. I did it the same time last year, and it's just now muscle memory, I guess. All of a sudden, my body goes, hey, it's that time of the month, or that time of the year. Um, otherwise, you know, trucking along, um, cooking, doing my thing. Right. We were talking about your cooking earlier, and that was enough for me. It's, it's gourmand for anybody who's listening. It's not that it's bad. It's just uh, different. Jenny, you've got new hair. I do. I well, same hair, different color. Yep, and 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 bangs. Yeah. I, and I bangs. Changed, and I change it up every uh, every uh, year and a half or so. So it was time for a change, leading into the fall. Is br is brown hair Jenny different from blonde Jenny? No, we're in any way. As, we're equally as fun. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's the whole Betty Veronica Bailey quarters thing. It's all the blonde brunette thing is a big uh, new leader, new do. <laughs> right? It's a whole new era. This exactly. is the O'Toole hair. That's what it is. 
I got my. I, I've got the impression that the O'Toole leadership is going to be the driving force of Jenny's life going forward. For sure, that's the way she talks about it. Well, I'm. I'm not sure about that. I'm kidding. <laughs> it sustains you. It drives you. You are Aaron, and Aaron is you. <laughs> so, speaking of him, speaking of him, uh, he. Uh, Came out, did a news conference, uh, impressed everybody with his first news conference, and um, has uh, business journalists writing thoughtfully about his policy platform and uh, and some ideas he's got for the economy. Uh, but he also got sideswiped uh, sideswiped by a, a backbench member of parliament who put out a tweet. Uh, about uh, Christia Freeland and George Soros, which is widely interpreted to be an anti-Semitic, which is uh, which is uh, ridic- which is ridiculous. It was tried to be interpreted. Okay, well, let's start there. Why is it ridiculous? Well, because Go ahead, it, Jane. Wasn't, it wasn't it wasn't anti-Semitic in the least. It uh, it, it was uh, it was pointing out that uh, she had a had a relationship with uh, uh, George Soros, which she obviously uh, had some relationship, even if it was professional. Uh, George Soros is a very uh, controversial uh, lightning rod of a figure. He's no different than uh, he's no different than Donald Trump. But I think for this government to say that this was anti-Semitic is is completely unbelievable and over the top. And anyone that jumped on that bandwagon uh, is just is completely wrong. We're talking about a government like if we want to actually talk about some anti-Semitic things. This is a government who reinstated funding to UNRWA in the tune of one hundred and ten million dollars, an organization that teaches kids in school. Uh, that it, Hitler was right, and it was okay to kill the Jews and death to Israel. They uh, they glorify um, uh, Hamas suicide bombers. One one guy, uh, Abdullah Balgucci, uh, who who was responsible for killing sixty seven people in the Second Intifada. So I think it's a bit rich for this government to say that a single tweet um, is anti Semitic. Well, it had something to it, Jenny, because the liberals tried all week to make an issue out of Derek Sloan. And they had the pressure on O'Toole has to denounce Sloan, O'Toole has to dump Sloan. And that got no traction. Nobody gave a shit about that. That was liberals barking in the uh, in the wilderness about that. But when this email came along, when this tweet came along, everybody jumped on that. I'm not an expert in this, but my understanding is that in the dark worlds of the web where that MP follows things, this is an anti-Semitic thing. Maybe to a normal person, you don't think of George Soros as a symbol of international Jewish control of the financial system because you just think of him as a businessman, a philanthropist, whatever. But I think in that dark world that that MP is involved in, it does mean that shit. 100%. This what do you mean, she's, this is, what this do you mean is, she's involved in? That's a ridiculous statement. It was a, it this was is a, all the amplification of like the, you know, the tinfoil hat, Trumpy, uh, globalist conspiracy stuff that, you know, has been huge south of the border. And it's also led to things like, I don't know, people sending pipe bombs to George Soros's house. Like there is a cost and there is a violence to this stuff that, you know, I think it is it is right for folks to be calling this stuff out because when you have a party in Canada that is, you know, winking and nodding in that direction of, you know, the sort of right wing, alt right, globalist conspiracy stuff like that, that is a cause for concern. Uh, this isn't just, you know, you know, uh, you know, though the government overreached on how they reacted to this. Like the the original sin is somebody trolling around in the darker places of the web, and you know, cozying up to alt right conspiracy theorists, like Jagmeet Singh uh, uh, saying, uh, buying into the conspiracy theorists that uh, Rudipur Singh Malik and uh, the others that have been charged and convicted with the Air India bombing uh, might not have done it. It, there is there is a a massive difference between the kind of <laughs> anti globalist uh, Trump touting dark places in in on the internet, 4chan, 8chan, these types of conspiracies that get thrown out that we're seeing have a not only a political but a physical violence cost. People die. People are sending pipe bombs to people's houses. People are activated by this type of 
over overwrought rhetoric. People bring guns to protests because they are, you know, trying to protect this, you know, I don't know. Anyway. But this is what I mean. This is why are we turning this into this? It, it, it was it was a woman who retweeted something that obviously Carrie Lynn I uh, I didn't even know what the organization was. I don't even know what the, the what the Twitter handle. Like I don't know what the. But is that a, that's not an excuse? Handle. Like you're an elected member, you can't just go. Oh well, I didn't know what that was. Um, you know, I don't know. Like no, maybe the have are trying, the liberals are trying. The liberals are trying uh, to turn the channel because Aaron O'Toole had a very successful week, and just like always, you guys are helping them and propping them up. That's exactly what's happening. Well, I don't think so, Jenny. I think the liberals tried to turn the channel and were unsuccessful. I think this Carrie Lynn MP changed the channel. And you know, one of the things I, I don't think it changed changed the channel for one of the things I think is in, one of the things I think is interesting about it, and it speaks to I guess the divides in our politics is that she obviously didn't think that was bad politically to do. She obviously didn't anticipate the reaction. Um. Uh, to that, which is interesting, because it was so from the left, it uh, was so monolithic and so strong. But not just, I wouldn't want to say from the left. It seemed to me that most mainstream people were saying this is, an, as Chris said, an American style of Paul. Anyway, I don't want to get too hung up on this point about it, because it's not the be-all and the end-all. But it is an indication that the Conservative caucus is still going to generate, for Aaron O'Toole, the kind of flare-ups that... Um, whether they change the channel on the street or not, Jenny, change the channel in the media, for sure. So um, it was a messier end of the first week for Mr. O'Toole than I think he, than I think he would have liked. But then it all got caught up. Then it all got caught up in the Sir John A. Macdonald statue um, thing, which which morphed into its own identity politics um, kind of issue, and the conservatives tried to play that. Politically. Jenny, what do you think of the politics of that, the statue stuff? Well, I, I don't think it was politics. I think uh, Aaron and the party uh, said exactly what the majority of Canadians, uh, the Canadians felt. And obviously, you know, Premier Legault and the mayor of Montreal echoed the exact same thing, that the statue was going up. Sir Johnny Macdonald was the first prime minister of Canada. Uh, and uh, the protesters shouldn't have uh, tore it down. I think the, I don't think it's politics. I think it's just stating what the average uh, Canadian uh, feels, which is why other politicians commented on it as well. Trudeau was late to the game, but he commented on it as well, saying it was unacceptable. How do you feel about statues, Chris? Um, I have a, I have a, a, a thing about, I don't know whether we need to be erecting statues to politicians uh, I get, you know, there's a long history with Johnny McDonald, founding father, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I just feel that, you know, <coughs> there are better things for us to be spending our time, um, you know, louding and building statues to. Um, I don't think that getting rid of the statue erases John A. McDonald's legacy from history. Um, so, you know, there's a bit of a, you know, what are we accomplishing here? I understand the reasoning why, and you know, you know, uh, we don't need to be, you know, putting up statues with people with legacies of, you know, uh, terror, the indigenous community, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, well, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure that um, you know tearing it down is the right message. I think what we need to be doing is working on the issues that are still lingering in our politics and still lingering in our society. And that should be the monument that we build as a society is to do better, not to look back and, you know, constantly loud people with these complicated legacies. And I, I say complicated legacies because, you know, there are obviously arguments to be made on the other side around, well, you know, that was the time. And, you know, there, everybody from that time has a tough legacy and, you know, not everybody's clean on a lot of these issues. I get that, but I think the monument that we should be building as a society is a better society that's actually taking on some of these issues and doing better. Okay, so would you would you would you put the statue back up then? I don't know. I mean, I and don't know was, what the point is. Was, like, was, what's the point of putting the the statue are, back up? And right? like, and and what if what if in Weyburn, Saskatchewan, Tommy Douglas's statue was was uh, uh, destroyed uh, because of his support for eugenics, the sterilization of um, 
uh, people that had disabilities 50, 60 years ago, the same as Nellie McClung, her statue and the famous five are up on Parliament Hill. It's one of the newest statues that have been erected, that and the War uh, of 1812 Memorial. I think those are the only two new statues that I actually can remember being put on Parliament Hill in the 20 some years that I was in Ottawa. So me personally, would I, would I be angry if those statues got taken down? No, they're statues. And the, the point that I'm making is they're statues the problem is, is that the issues that are in, that are in place and the issues that people are frustrated about and the reason why these statues are the points of focus is that there's nothing getting done about them. So it is about partially about the statue, but the statue is a focal point for anger, for the lack of structural change for communities that have not seen any change and they've been advocating it for years. Okay, that's a good point. That's a good point. But, you know, isn't there a value to positive myths? I mean, these statues represent myths. These icons represent myths about our nations. And I like some of those myths. I, I think they're important. I, I, I like what they do in a way to societies. I think that, you know, Abraham Lincoln was probably not the nicest guy in the world. He probably made Amy Klobuchar look not so bad with her staff. He was probably a difficult person. Um, but I like the Abraham Lincoln myth about the world. And, and there's lots of evidence of what a horrible, wretched person Winston Churchill was in many ways. But I love the Winston Churchill defeated the Nazis story. And it's an important one, I think. And, you know, I think that the United States has these national myths which help them uh, hang together and help them understand what their country's um, supposed to be about in the best instances of those um, of those myths. Canada doesn't have en enough of those or, or any of them, maybe really. So like, so that's part like, and just to build on that, that's part of where I, I want to go is like, let's build, let's build new myths. Let's build new, better, positive myths. Right. So yeah, I mean, our history is part of what defines us, but our future is as well. Hey, but the, the two, the two can be done at the same time. I don't think we want to build new myths. I think our history is what our history is. Like good or bad, we can't we can't change it. And there's there are places that you can go where people had like where horrible things happen. It's how people go why people go to Auschwitz Birkenau. They it, it's run by the Jewish community because they want people to see what happened. They they don't want it, it to be erased so it can never so it can never happen again. Like residential schools, I, I heard on the radio this morning as I was getting ready uh, that the government has decided to uh, open up. Uh, two residential schools, I'm not sure where, uh, so people can go and actually see how horrible these things were and, and, and how devastating it was to children who went to residential schools. So the world can't forget. Right. And so, you know, but let's, let's not pick and choose, right? And so that's, I think, part of what people are saying about some of these statues is that you know, we choose to say good things about one person, but we don't talk about the full legacy necessarily, right? And so, fine, like, put up your statue. No, but that's the John point of the myth. Sorry, Chris, sorry. No, Chris, I know, I get, I get what the point of the myth is. You I take get. the person and you distill it down to one thing. You're actually not honoring Sir John A. Macdonald, the human being. You're honoring Sir John A. Macdonald, who created Canada. That's the one thing it's built distilled down to. Abraham Lincoln, you're honoring the guy who freed the slaves. Winston Churchill, you're honoring the guy that beat the Nazis and Hitler, right? It's not about the rest of it. It's about that one thing that's central to the myth of the nation. But it's also, you know, who controls, who gets to make that call about that one thing, right? Like, that, like this is more complicated than just, I think mean, we all know, like, I'm not trying to be like, guys, this is more complicated. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just so you know. He's left explaining it to us, Jenny. He's so <laughs> left explaining it to us. <laughs> no, but I mean, like, it, 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 there, is, there is also, like, the, the conversation, which is, like, we could have a whole podcast about who actually gets to decide who gets to make that the myth and the one thing that we talk about, right? And so are those things laudable things? Of course they are. Do they need to be, you know, statues that are on the lawns of, you know, every, you know, legislature, city hall in, in Canada? I don't know. I don't think so. I think there are other things that we could be spending our time uh, being happy as a nation about. We still obviously have some foundational myths, and that's fine, but we also need to have, uh, you know, a really clear view of who we are as a country and a really clear view of our history. Well, there you go. Jenny, last thought? No, I've said it all, what, what, I, was, what, what, what I thought. Okay. So, uh, 
you know, just to flow from Aaron O'Toole, there's um, uh, seems to be, uh, and you know, we. I thought I thought Susan Delacroix had a great uh, phrase in her article this column this week when she talked about how the implausible becomes the inevitable in front of your eyes on elections, and it not that long ago it seemed to me completely ridiculous that we would have an election in the very short term, but now. It doesn't seem as ridiculous. People are talking about it as if it's a serious option. Uh, Chris, a lot of people are saying the ball rests squarely in the uh, NDP's court on this. Uh, and it all centers around this speech from the throne this fall, uh, the fact that the government prorogued the House and justified that prorogation on the need to prepare for what was going to be a speech from the throne that was going to very dramatically lay out policies to take advantage of this crisis and remake Canada, in the Prime Minister's words. And they are letting expectations run hard on what this is going to be. I, I read the other day David Olive, the business columnist, comparing what was going to come out in the speech from the throne uh, to uh, the introduction of Medicare and the Charter of Rights in terms of its transformational effect on Canadian society. So... <laughs> That's a pretty big set of expectations that they've got running for this fall. A lot of speculation is that it's around the area of income support and some version of a basic income. But layer on top of that, nonetheless, the fact that <clears throat> one way or another, either if it happens this fall because they're defeated or it happens this fall because they pull the plug or it happens in the spring, this speech from the throne is not just a serious policy document to um, do something bold to remake the Canadian society. It's also an election document. It's also a platform. It will obviously be the platform on which the Liberal Party will be running. So when it's a platform, in addition to uh, a speech from the throne, then all of a sudden people like me get involved. Uh, who would never have any hand in writing a normal speech from the throne, but are likely to have a very strong hand in writing an election document, and a, a, a platform document. So what is this, and what are you expecting um, out of this speech from the throne, and what are you expecting this fall, Jenny? Oh, okay. Well, uh, I think this is going to be less of a policy document than it's going to be a vision statement. It's kind of like, do you know, like five years ago, all my friends had like, Bristol board envisions like a big house and a good looking guy and, and, you know, a nice car, you know, palm Pick trees a fence. for trips. So I think this is going to be more of a, of a liberal vision board. I think that, um, I do think that guaranteed income, they're obviously uh, starting to float that at least, uh, in terms of, of what, what we've seen. So I think whether the liberals, I don't think they'll bring themselves down, although they can. And I think that, there's a part of them and probably a segment within the party uh, that would like to do that. Probably the more political people that are like, let's get this fucking thing over with. Kind of like why Higgs is doing it in New Brunswick now. Let's get this over with before everybody realizes how bad this is. How, when unemployment could jump again, when you know, schools are back, if you know, there's outbreaks in schools, let's just get this over with. I think it's going to be hard for them to pull the plug on themselves. I think they could do that um, in the spring. Uh, and I think that if... If it is a vision document and it includes things like guaranteed in income um, uh, support, I think it'll be very hard for the NDP not to uh, not to support that. By the way, just to get this, Higgs is cruising by the polling I've seen. Yeah, yeah. There's no downside to having called an election in the middle of this, and no no blowback from that. He's cruising. He's ahead by six or eight points, I think, and he won a majority. He won a government last time, a minority government last time. By losing six percent, by losing by six percent of the vote, so if he's yeah. ahead by six, he's almost certainly in majority it, territory. It seems like right now for them, which is probably why the Liberals are gonna are gonna look at this. And you've still got the competing visions, um, but I think that uh, I, that's exactly why he went. So you have a province that had very little COVID in it. I think they their reports or they have you know yesterday was like one case and like six active and their economy if you look at at the latest numbers their economy uh kind of jumped back proportionally better than uh most of the the rest of the country so uh I, higgs is probably uh feeling very uh 
um, happy now, and Kevin Vickers probably not so much. Yeah. Chris, is yeah. there an election this fall? I I'm not sure yet. Still, um, I think there there will be <clears throat> a bunch of brinksmanship. There's going to be a lot of drum beating going into this, and a lot of pressure put on my guy to kind of figure out what we're going to do. Um, I think the Liberals would be a bit emboldened, I think, by what they're seeing in New Brunswick. I get one province is not a country make, but, you know, that the governing party or didn't end up getting whacked by pulling the plug. Um, I'm, I'm still unsure, though, that... Leger has the NDP at 25% today. Is it Le I think it's Leger has the NDP at 25% today. Yeah, there is 21, 25. <clears throat> We're on the rise. Pardon me. I get choked up about this stuff. I see you rise in the polls. Um, so, yeah, I mean, all pressure's on, I think, on our guy. And I think that's good for Canadians and that's good for us. I think we need to use this as an opportunity to actually rep like recognize that there is some leverage here. Um, and, you know, and some mutually beneficial interest. And I think this is an opportunity for Jigmeet to get out there and start to define what uh, needs to be seen in a throne speech in order to help define himself a bit more. I think after the last campaign, people liked what they saw. They just haven't seen enough of him after the campaign. And I think this is an opportunity to, to lean in and use that leverage to, to deal with kind of the short, the short run strategic communicate, uh, strategic kind of considerations around what can we get out of this government uh, in a throne speech um, I think, you know, talking, you know, about the same old, you know, child care, the greatest hits will be fine. Um, I think we need to start to pivot a bit more towards talking jobs and talking, getting people back to work and figuring out ways that the government can insist in that and reach out a bit more broadly to Main Street, uh, more than I think they've seen us do over the last little while. Um but I think all of that stuff is going to be palatable to this liberal government. Um, strategically, though, we still have to have one sort of lefty hammer to, you know, beat the government with either to get what we want or to then claim, oh, look at how terrible they are. They, they're, they're not as woke or as progressive as we, they like to tell you that they are. So, Okay, but I let still, me be the devil's advocate. Yes. Let me be the devil's advocate. If the liberals are running on a social policy change uh, that is dramatic and bold, and if uh, and if the, they are trying to jam the election frame into a uh, investment versus austerity um, framework, and the conservatives will be actually playing into that. They won't want to be the austerity party. They'll want to be the jobs and growth party, and they'll label the liberals the spending party. Either way, the choice is kind of obvious to people in similar. Where would the NDP even fit into that if the liberals had a big enough idea on the table? I just think the NDP would get lost in that kind of an election. It feels like 74 or something. Well, that's the thing. So, like, I think I think that there there are there are two sort of there are two windows right now for consideration, right? There's the you know, pre-throne speech uh, positioning piece around what do we get out of them that's acceptable so we can claim victory and do the, you know, yay, Jack Layton budget thing that we did years and years ago that was successful to then building towards the next thing, uh, which was the campaign. So I think that, like, if I'm, if I'm in the brain trust right now... Can I stop and, you for a second? Because yeah. it's an interesting parallel. What Layton did in 2005 was Layton passed the budget the Liberal government's budget, and essentially said, we approve of their legislative program, and then defeated the Liberals on the basis of, introduced a special non-confidence motion on the basis of corruption, and defeated the government on the basis of corruption. So it was, no, we not, not that we disagree with what they're doing, we think they're too corrupt to be in office. That's a potential play this fall. Yep. And it, that's kind of where I'm going, right? So there's the first, there's the first tranche of you know, let's get the let's let's stake out the territory on you know jobs, the economy, on green recovery. I think you're going to see us talk a bit more about that as a sort of uh, economic engine. Um, I don't think you're going to find too much disagreement with you know things like guaranteed income, etc. And then the next window is the interesting window. To your point, right? So we're still in a place where I think you know does that throne speech change the channel enough from people viewing that, you know, maybe I'm not so much in love with Justin and his and his buddies anymore 
maybe I am still feel it. Maybe they are still feeling a bit of the sting of we, of the Aga Khan, of all these other things. And I think you might end up having a willing partner down the line in the conservative party in bringing down the government in, in that type of 2005 way. Um, but um, if I'm the new Democrats, I don't think I'm chomping at the bit for an election right now, but this is the, the play and the start of a sort of two or three chess move uh, uh, a gambit to continue with my chess analogies. Right. <laughs> do you think the, do you think they're going to bring, do you think that the NDP are going to support the liberals or bring them down, Jenny? Oh, I think right now, if it's what we think it's going to be as uh, the vision statement type stuff, I think they'll probably, I think they'll probably support the, uh, uh, the liberals. Uh, Cause I don't think there's going to be a lot of details in the, the, there will not be the details in the devil, so to speak. I think it's going to be very overarching. And I think that it's going to be a real challenge for the conservatives when they're putting together their, uh, their platform, so to speak, uh, in terms of uh, how far they push on austerity. You know where I personally stand on this. But as of now, and we've talked about this ad nauseum, uh, and I think the last time, Chris, when you were on with us, that um, right now the full economic ramifications of COVID have not taken into effect. I think this fall and, and winter is going to be very rough for the yeah. job market. It's not just going to be the service industry, like the you know the Ontario or the Canadian Restaurants Association put out a report that you know sixty percent of restaurants are going to be gone within the next year, never to kind of come back. So I think it's going to be more over overarching um, uh, in terms of uh, the economic ramifications. So again, uh, they're going to want to go. But I think that the conservatives have to be careful. I know Aaron was out talking about uh, talking about CERB and, and uh, it being ineffective. And I actually think that out of all the programs the Liberals have done in the last six months, CERB has actually been the most effective, the most yeah. support, like the, 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 the thing that people have supported the most. And I think there's so many things to go in on the, how the Liberals have handled this from uh, the wage subsidy uh, to the rental income assistance, which now is tied to another potential liberal scandal to the Canada student grant program with we, I think the conservatives have to be very careful in the line that they, um, they walk on, uh, on this. And, and I'm not saying that there should be no talk of debt and deficit. Like Fitch's ratings were out last week that said Canada has to be careful because uh, their credit, credit rating could be further decreased if there's no plan for deficit or debt reduction um, that they don't see one in the next year. And of course we, we went down to a double A rating um, in June. So I, I think it's going to be a very interesting one to watch. I don't see Aaron. Another thing he indicated on, on uh, this week was there was no interest in the conservatives right now to trigger an election. Right. The, can it's I, funny. Can, the, the election could revolve around a, a, a debate about an arcane monetary policy theory about whether or not there are actual limits to how much we can spend there's this new thing called modern monetary theory i was touching on it last week with kevin yeah. carmichael about how you don't have to go to the bond markets to borrow money you just go to the bank of canada and they print whatever money you need and uh, so therefore you can have as much as you you can have as much as you want um so <laughs> i know party time eh? excellent sounds great <laughs> but what it's you know a, so I, it could be yeah. Go ahead, Jenny. Go I ahead. said it would be horrible. I, can you imagine being a campaign manager where you're trying to, like, you're whiteboarding and doing your boxes <laughs> yeah. to write a narrative <laughs> on, like, an arcane monetary policy yeah. for the Bank of Canada? Oh, like, I know. In, like I know. oh, my God. One side's we'll get, warning we'll about inflation. To, yeah, we'll yeah. just find that one economist and get him to run for us or something. We're like, oh, you know, <laughs> he's, he's finance minister. <laughs> but great. Okay. This this is why conservatives have to keep it on the economy and, and how uh, and the liberals are going to have to keep their eye out in terms of like layoffs. You're seeing more and more layoffs in terms of yeah. uh, the tourism industry. You're now seeing the hotels, which kind of had not really done massive layoffs. But in the last couple of months, they've now started to lay off thousands and thousands of, of people. I think Hilton laid off close to 20,000 people. And so I think that if you're the liberals now, you have to watch uh, in terms of next uh, next steps because we're still sitting uh, like our, our job numbers are, are fine. Well, they're, they're going up. It's getting better. But we're still sitting with 11 percent unemployment rate, at least for July. We'll see. We'll see this week uh, what the August rate is. And in that economic frame, I think, you know, I think any party needs to also be mindful of the fact that I think I probably brought this up before that, you know, millennials who are now in their 30s and having kids and 
trying and failing at buying houses, have now faced two significant economic shocks in the last you know, 12 years and have been set back far more than other generations in the past. And how do you get that cohort super motivated with an economic picture that looks better than the one that they faced since they've been growing up, right? Like, what is the what is the stimulus and jobs package for folks like that that are feeling a little m- more hopeless than they even did before, right? So uh, I think that's something to watch, uh, hopefully from our guys and hopefully from anybody, um, a bit of a targeted relief package for those young families and those trying to, you know, those people from the service industry have lost their jobs and are now things are looking pretty bleak. Speaking of pretty bleak, can I ask you a quick question, Chris? Jenny, if you got a point of view about this, I'd love to hear it too. But <clears throat> the ECOS had a poll out yesterday of Saskatchewan in the advance of the Saskatchewan provincial election. And it had the SAS party at 60% and the NDP at 28 And that that prompted me to go do a little bit of research. And I found out that between 1944 and 2003, Twice the NDP had gotten 39% in an election campaign. And other than that, they'd always been above 40 and generally well above 40. And now they are not relevant in the birthplace of the party. Is that something people think about in the NDP? Um, you know, I don't, I don't think it's necessarily an existential crisis like in, the, in Ottawa. Uh, but I do think that it is indicative of a shift in in voters' minds around what they expect and what they want from the NDP, right? I find that, you know, Saskatchewan NDPers, Manitoba NDPers have been a lot more pragmatic um, than some of the other folks on, in, in the party. Um, they are able to reach out to more rural constituencies, more of the bands outside of the cities um, with, you know, there is a bit of a, you know, a social message, a bit more of an economic message that, you know, I don't know that folks are seeing themselves reflected in any of that now um, in some of those provinces. Um, you know, I've, I've talked a bit about this before around, you know, I don't know that people see the NDP uh, as we've got your back in the same way that they used to. Uh, I think, you know, John Horgan and what he's been doing in BC is very interesting as kind of a model um, that people might want to look at and how they've kind of started to frame, you know, New Democrats. So that province obviously has its own dynamics and New Democrats out there are a lot different than sort of New Democrats in Ontario. But, you know, just even like the general frame of let's make your life more affordable, let's invest in the services you rely on, <clears throat> and let's build a province that works for everyone like that's a pretty interesting and flexible uh, frame that's within a new Democrat frame, but also can reach out beyond the big cities and reach out beyond sort of some of the, some of the other political minefields that we tend to wade into that maybe turn people off. So um, I, I, I think it's indicative of uh, a need for us to kind of think about how do we reach those voters in a way that we haven't over the last, I don't know how long, I mean, even federally. You know, uh, there's there's a need for us to to talk to a different voter set and actually know who our voters are. And I'm I'm uh, I'm not sure that we have always a great handle on who our core voter could be or should be. Okay, uh, Jenny, one last question. Then we got to take a quick break. But my question for you is: You know Brad Wall well, right? I know I I know I know, I know Brad. Yeah. Okay. I'm not saying, I, I'm not saying I, I know him personally well, but I know him. Yes. Fair enough. I mean, how? He destroyed the NDP, like the trajectory of the party over his time in from uh, the leadership of the Saskatchewan party. I mean, he just took a knife and drove it right into their heart. And what makes him, is he that skillful a politician? Yeah, I think, it was pretty pretty amazing transformation under his period of time there. I think he's extremely smart. I think he is charismatic and I think he had a good handle on uh, 
uh, he had a good handle on uh, uh, what what the needs of the province the province uh, the province was. This is it was under him that resource development uh, that re- resource development started because there were for for years Saskatchewan was sitting on for natural gas and what have you uh, like a a gold mine so to speak the same as Alberta. And I think to Chris's point, if you look at Horgan, uh, he's an NDP. He has been able to to get his, to skill his way through. Um, being an NDP premier that is uh, in a coalition with the Greens and also be pr- pro resource development, like pro natural gas, like yeah. it's it's actually very. I think it's very skillful, and I think you know Chris knows this obviously a hundred times uh, more than me. But it, it it kind of right now is uh, I'm not going to say a fight for identity, but the NDP has the challenge that uh, other parties have gone through before, where it's the prairie populist, um, uh, you know, NDP the the reform. NDP switchers from like British Columbia and, and uh, Saskatchewan to the urban uh, to the urban um, voters that that are more into like you know pro transportation funding and and yeah. you know climate change and and what have you and it's it's very hard to appeal to those um, appeal to those uh, two segments. Okay, we have to take a short break to hear from a new sponsor, which is very exciting for the Hurley Burley. And when we come back, each of us is going to give the leaders some advice. (laughs) You know, the run on toilet paper at the start of the pandemic has become sort of a sheepish joke. It said all sorts of things about our priorities and our trust or lack of trust in the supply chains that keep shelves stocked. When more toilet paper appeared in the stores, Canadians relaxed and went on with life in lockdown. What they didn't realize is why more toilet paper appeared so fast. They didn't know that railroaders at CN whose job it is to constantly monitor Canada's supply chains, had spotted the problem early and prioritized shipments to accommodate it. Room was made for high-demand items like flour, toilet paper, and other grocery staples. In fact, as most Canadians locked down, the vast majority of CN's 26,000 employees kept reporting for work every day. The trains kept rolling, the supply chains kept moving. CN actually moved a record amount of grain from Western Canada this year. CN has been around for a hundred years. It looms large. Air Canada began as a small airplane service for CN passengers. The CBC started out as CN's internal entertainment service. And now CN is a sponsor of our pod. It noticed our success and our respectful if profane tone and decided the hurly burly is something Canadians need more of. We'll be telling you more about CN as time passes, but for now, we just want to say welcome. Okay, we're back. Chris, it's uh, in terms of uh, a fall election or election timing, pick a leader and tell me what your advice to that leader would be. Um, I'm going to play it safe, and I'm going to uh, give Jigmeet Singh a bit of advice. Okay. Um, so uh, I think I touched, upon, I touched upon this a little bit earlier in the pod. So... Uh, I think we need to be looking at this in two distinct tranches. Um, one is the short term, and you know, obviously, you know, go in on childcare, go in on the, some of those greatest hits, but do not, do not, do not forget a coherent economic message that is focused on jobs and focused on getting f- people back to work. Um, I, I, you know, I love a good social program. I love a good social safety net. It's great, uh, but um, there are people across this country who are mad because they don't have a job. They didn't see their government necessarily stand up for them in a way that they would have liked to have seen to keep their job. There is a generation that has been screwed over for 12 years by a lot of things that were outside of their own control. Uh, reach into those folks and talk about getting them back to work and increasing their prospects um, over the next, you know, five to ten years. Um, I know the there will be parts of the party that will be pushing hard, hard, hard for things like pharmacare and other things. Sure, um, but uh, I think our message needs to be jobs, 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 stimulus, 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 and we've got your back to get you back to work. And we're going to make sure that this recovery works for all of Canada. And on election timing, what's your advice to the leader? I still think, you know, I think 
you extract what you can. I think you pull a, you think you pull a latent. That's a thing that we, that we say in, inside the party is pull a latent. Um, yeah, sure. And right. You, uh, I think you extract as much as you can. Uh, you claim victory. You do it loudly and proudly. I think you get out there now to determine what those things are that you're going to try to extract from the government, so that people can actually hear you. Because I think there's also just a volume problem. People aren't hearing what we're saying. Um, and you hold your nose and you say this is a great thing that we got out of got for Canadians, and you plan for the next move. Jenny. Who's, your, who's the leader you're advising and what advice are you giving? Well, because we've kind of already talked about Justin Trudeau and the vision board as to what I think he's going to do, which is probably what advice I would, uh, I would give him. So that's part of why I'm, I have the preconceived thought as to what he, uh, uh, he will do. I will, I will go safe and also stick with my party. Uh, I think what I would tell Aaron to do just on a practical basis is to get ready for an election campaign, uh, just in case. The focus should, uh, for the most part, uh, be on the party. The parliamentary stuff can can follow suit. But I say that as someone uh, uh, with uh, more of a history and on party side of things than on the uh, uh, on the uh, parliamentary thing. I would uh, start developing uh, some policies and and not just as we talked about with Serb and and COVID. I think the Conservatives have an opportunity uh, to be kind of the voice uh, uh, the voice of the of the little guy. So high interest rates. Um, uh, banks are gouging people. Uh, high cell phone bills. I thought from the last ele election, Jagmeet Singh's uh, announcement the first week, the day after the first uh, debate on lowering cell phone bills, I think resonated across party lines because you eventually saw that the Conservatives and Liberals followed suit. And all the Liberals have essentially done is strike up a working committee to review cell phone bills because, of course, they don't want to take on the telecoms. So um, I think that the Conservatives can uh, look at ways, and I think it, I'm not saying there shouldn't be any austerity, but I think they should look at ways uh, for policies that can resonate with the average voters. I think wait until the end of September when the six month mortgage deferral uh, uh, program uh, ends and you're going to see people who not only are now back paying their mortgages where they might not have jobs and can afford it. They're also paying a higher rate of their mortgages because it's not like the banks just tacked on. Uh, six months to the end of your mortgage, they've actually now prorated it. So you're paying more when you actually uh, yep. pay. So I think those are some of the uh, uh, the policies because it's a fallacy that uh, the Conservatives are the party of, uh, of Bay Street. They haven't been for years and years and years. It truly is actually the Liberal Party. I think Bay Street would argue they don't have a party these days, but uh, that's not necessarily the worst thing. I uh, also hey, I'm... I'm uh, sorry, my one bit of since since you know I, my one little bit of advice for Aaron is to also stop talking about putting jobs into hibernation because I have no idea what the fuck that means. He brought he trotted that out yesterday, and I was like, "What the fuck does that mean?" The liberals should have put jobs into hibernation. Mm. <laughs> Just say okay. Well, I mean that sounds much better to me. Hey, eh? if I had had a job rather than kill my job, put it into hibernation. I mean, at least that way it may wake up. You never know. Um, Justin Trudeau, you know, in 1977, after René Levesque was elected, Pierre Trudeau and the Liberal Party went up over 50% in the national polls. And they were enormously strong in regions they weren't normally strong in, like, the, like uh, they were, you know, projected to elect a number of people in Saskatchewan. It was that kind of, we need these people to manage this particular crisis. And there was... Um, and uh, there was a brief consensus about that. And Trudeau was urged to call an election, considered calling an election. Um, campaign team was all ready and set to go. And then for whatever reasons, he didn't call an election. And then the economy went into a deep recession and he was defeated by Joe Clark, um, ultimately. Uh, I think the Liberals should go this fall. Um I think that it's only going to get worse electorally um, as the economy gets worse. Uh, I think they need to get out in front of that um, economic deterioration. Uh, I think that the austerity versus investment framework is a very, very good one for them with one addition. Uh, they need to appear to have a jobs plan that will work at creating jobs. The Conservatives have a lot of brand strength on the economy 
Um, and the liberals don't need to worry about most of it. Um, you don't need to worry about the fact that regardless of what Jenny says about uh, Bay Street, that people think that um, the conservatives understand business and the business community better than liberals do, that people think that conservatives uh, will uh, care more about fiscal responsibility than liberals will. Um, there's all sorts of economic traits that the conservatives own that the liberals don't need to worry about. But if the, but the liberals to, to get elected in any election, the liberals need to be seen as the best party to create jobs in the country. That, that piece of economic territory they need to own. And so that's especially acute in this circumstance. And so coming out of this speech from the throne, they need to have not just a bold social policy initiative, but they need to have a bold jobs program to balance that off. And then they should pull the plug and go and win a majority. There, well, we solved it. I guess we'll see if our parties <laughs> listen to us. <laughs> <laughs> that hasn't happened in a long time. Don't worry. <laughs> that, that, that is for damn sure. That is for damn sure. That wouldn't have even happened. That wouldn't have even happened when I when I did know people in Ottawa. Anyway, yeah, so there's crickets. <laughs> so I, I uh, in my circle of friends, something utterly and absolutely amazing happened this week. In the past, sorry, in the past couple of weeks, which is that the Democrats had a convention and the Republicans had a convention. And in my world, the world I live in of my personal friends and my social media feeds and everything like that, the Democratic convention was a triumph. It was compelling speaker after compelling speaker laying bare the fascist regime of Donald Trump and the fundamental core threat to everything that we hold dear that he represents. Yeah. And these people were professional and they were met and they were impressive and eloquent and they, it was, and it had good ratings and people watched it. And then the Republicans came along and 90% of the speaker's last name was Trump. And the vision that was laid out was incredibly dystopian and, uh, and uh, and grim, they took the Hatch Law, which tries to separate politics and government in the United States, and blew it to fucking smithereens uh, by putting fireworks over the over the uh, Washington Monument and using the front of the White House as a. All of these things are up. Like again, my world, people were fucking appalled by the Republican convention and. Uh, and besides that, fewer people watched it. More people watched Kamala Harris, Kamala Harris than watched uh, oh. than watched Donald Trump. Okay, um, David, how, how many? So wait, I'm just I'm, I'm leading to something. I'm leading to something, which is at the end of that whole process, Biden's lead over Trump is cut in half. And so there are Americans out there who saw something that nobody in my world saw whatsoever in those two conventions. Is they saw something didn't necessarily make them feel better about Trump because I'm still seeing data that says that Trump's unfavorables went up and Biden's unfavorables went down. But in terms of the choice, it was narrowed and now is easily still within uh, within margin of error territory or within a reasonable swing territory in all of the important states. Sorry, Jenny, I know you wanted to get in. I just wanted to, just wanted to say that there's a very big disconnect in my world about what those conventions looked like to me and what they looked like to obviously some Americans. Well, and, and how many in your network that that's head exploded uh, over these conventions are actually voting uh, either way, voting in the U S in the upcoming election. Oh, uh, well, I don't know. Some of them are Americans on Twitter, but most of them are Canadians. You're right. This so. is, but this is, this is, this is, this is the issue. And you're right. Things are, are, uh, uh, they are, um, tightening up for uh, for Biden. Uh, I think that probably uh, it's the left that continues to call uh, Donald Trump a fascist and anyone that supported him are fascist. 66 million people did vote for him in the last election. So I think it remains a disconnect that the Democrats keep using this inflammatory language because it's extremely insulting. Um, uh, but just in terms of pure numbers, you're, you're right. Uh, if you look at polling back from 2016, uh, two and a half weeks or two weeks prior to the uh, 2016 
uh, presidential election, Hillary was up by 12 points. That's a national poll. And at that point, there's a website called uh, 270towin.com because that's the electoral college. And they had in different aggregates, because they used 10 aggregates, uh, they had anywhere from Hillary winning by 278 to um, uh, 308 um, uh, electoral college votes. This website now, they have tightened it. They still have Biden winning. I think they have them at 272 the last time I checked, but they continue to have states like Missouri in just the leaning towards Trump, where the last polls out have Trump 11 points up over Biden. They haven't called North Carolina. They haven't called Arizona. They haven't called Florida. They haven't called Wisconsin. By the way, in the last campaign, they, they, they called all of those a solid uh, blue state. So I think that um, if the Democrats are going to make the same mistake that they did last time by using kind of the language that you and your friends do about, uh, about Trump, um, then I think it leaves, it seeds the floor for him actually talking about uh, policy and, and he is going to end up winning, uh, winning again. And I'm saying this as I can be rational enough. I have actually criticized Trump uh, for handling different things. The George Floyd thing, for example, and the fact that he is extremely divisive uh, in polarizing. I've actually said that if Democrats actually want to win and if they lose um, this this campaign, essentially the same camp, Biden's running the same campaign Hillary Clinton did. They have to take a take a big look in the mirror as to as to determine uh, where their party is going to be headed in the future. Yeah, I mean, yes. Do the do, do the Democrats need to do a real big think about who they are? Yeah, there there. I think there needs to be. Uh, a bit of a reckoning around where the future lies, and especially when it comes to, you know, is this the you know party of AOC or is this the party of Joe Biden and sort of the centrist, super big tent, so big that it might collapse uh, Democrats, right? So you know, Biden is underperforming Clinton in a lot of these swing states around the same time, and in the middle of a pandemic, and in the middle of a you know ra- uh, reckoning on on racial justice and you know wide wide held opinion that Donald Trump is just unfit for office. So you know something is obviously askew around how Democrats are connecting, and I don't know that uh, make the bad man stop is necessarily as powerful of a message as Democrats think it is. And if you look at the messaging pillars and what you know, what Trump was doing in that convention specifically, he's touching on some very, like, deep emotional stuff, right? That is, you know, the real motivating things that people wouldn't maybe admit that they maybe nod to and agree with, right? So he's talking about, you know, that little gut perception about, you know, Joe Biden is old and out of it, right? Same sort of thing he did with with Hillary, and it kind of stuck a little bit, right? People see Joe and they're like, is he okay today, right? That little doubt that he likes to, to put in there. Um, he's sort of, he's hitting that reptilian brain piece around, you know, they're taking America away from us. Um, and being a little bit, you know, not super blatant sometimes and other times super blatant about who the us is. Um, And if you're looking at, you know, where the numbers are and the support for some of the protests that are happening around the country, those numbers are starting to decline a little bit and people are starting, starting to relapse a bit into the, well, this is getting a little out of hand and things are a little bit scary now. And and as long as people are in that place, uh, I think the Republicans currently have a stronger message than the Democrats do, right? You know, if you look at polling in in, in most states, Morning Consult so, said the Republican gains after the two conventions were among suburban women and non college educated white people. Right, right. That's violence. That's violence. Hundred yeah, um, percent. Because the, pro- the protests have morphed into just mobs of people, like like you see people in Portland, like people being dragged out of their cars and 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 beaten. There was a a uh, video on Twitter that was going around yesterday of some poor old guy uh, walking down the street and someone ran up behind him with a hammer and, and hit him, uh, hit him in the back of his head and he collapsed and, and the people filming his, the guy that hit with the hammer, his friends laughing about it. Like it's turned, it's not a, like these aren't 
protest. I believe in peaceful protests. I think people should be allowed to protest, whether I agree with what they're protesting about or not. But these aren't protests anymore. This is genuine law- lawlessness. Like, so, yeah, and part of part of part of that debate that that you know is happening around are these protests or are these riots also plays into the Trump frame, right? Around let's make sure that this gets framed as, you know, violence. The majority of the protests that have happened have been nonviolent. Let me also remind you that there was a video of a young 16-year-old man in Kenosha who shot three people and walked past the police like nothing happened. So, you know, there's, there is violence happening and, and not just in the way that, you know, the Republicans want to frame it. Um, but I think it, part of this so is this also is on like, Biden. What does Biden have to do, Chris? So, like, what so, is part is, can, what? so part of it is like, you know, we all look at the tightening race and we go kind of, I think it's also a synonym for like, how could it be so close? Right. And, and part of the reason is, is that like the problems didn't go away. Right. The problems of people are out of work. The problems of, you know, BIPOC communities feeling like they do not have a voice and that they are not a part of the conversation, that they, they can't get ahead. All of these problems still exist, and Trump just keeps pointing at them and pushing at them and pulling those levers, right? And so part of what Biden needs to do is, you know, I think he needs to talk a lot more. He, well, first, I need to see him more. I do. I need to see him a lot more. And I need to see him almost, you know, playing a bit more whack-a-mole with Trump. I think he needs to be a bit more leading the conversation on, it's not just about Trump. It's about the economy. It's about getting us back out of, you know, the COVID recession. It's about us creating a, a more just and equal America. Um, I need to hear more of those things. I need him to go to Wisconsin. I need him to go to these swing states. I need him to talk about these things in, in, and I'm just not seeing it in a way that's meaningful. Right. Um, you know, also just back to the protests a a bit, I was listening to Cornell Booker the other day around sort of the, uh, how the protests kind of somehow get tied to Biden in a lot of ways. And, you know, he was, he, and I think I, I agree with where, what he says is around, there's also now the what next piece for the movement around, you know, what are the other tactics can be used um, to be able to talk about these things? Like there's a criminal justice bill that the Democrats passed through uh, Congress that is sitting there waiting for Mitch McConnell to sign it, which he won't, which provides an amazing hammer for folks like Biden and others to, to pound the Republican Party on policy and the, the fixes about the solves that we can do to make sure that these problems don't exist so that guys like Trump can't just keep pointing at them and, and, and shocking people's reptilian brains to, to, to be able to, to win the presidency, right? So I'm not seeing enough of a, of a response and a future vision. All I'm seeing right now is make the bad man stop. Yeah, but that's all Biden was designed to deliver. I mean, Biden was the very imperfect vehicle for selling a positive, hopeful future vision. He was just constructed to defeat Trump. That's his right, and that's and that's, that's the purpose. that is the strategic, uh, like sort of the 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 original sin, I think, of the strategy, right? In some ways, right? So I get that you know Biden doesn't offend a lot of people, but he doesn't inspire a lot of people, and when you're rousing an army up against a guy like Trump who is rousing his own army by pushing all these buttons, like Joe Biden isn't the guy to, to really raise that roof and really get people whipped up and excited. Hopefully Kamala can carry part of that, right? That's partially why she was, she was nominated as VP is that she's dynamic. She gets people going. She's full of energy. Um, but the top of the ticket feels a bit weak when it comes to, you know, if that's your only message, that's not going to be. Uh, that's not. That's not going to work out so well. Right. So we're in a nail biter, going down to the stretch. Hey, listen, you two. It's been fantastic talking with you today. Always had a blast. Chris, you have so earned your status as an honorary Hurley Burley <laughs> political panel member, and I am sure that you will be back. Um, it's it's like the and- Marvel extended universe. <laughs> I'm like that weird superhero you've never heard of, but every once in a while, I'm like, I'm like Ant-Man, I guess. Those two movies that were like, okay. 
And Jenny, this will always be a day that will demark uh, the um, pre-brunette and post-brunette Jenny on the Hurley Burley panel. You've uh, this is your first day as a brunette on the Hurley Burley panel. <laughs> It is, it is true. And and Thursday will be the one year anniversary of our first really, really political panel podcast. And there you go. And that will, you know what, that will have to be celebrated on a patio somewhere. Chris, you in? Oh, yeah. Let's yeah. do it. We'll do Absolutely. a live stream. All right, everybody. Thank you all for listening. Thank you to Metal Donkers Good for, again, engineering this episode and making it sound and uh, as good as it possibly can. Thank Jill Engelman for producing this show and pulling it all together. We'll be back next week with probably a two-parter and certainly Scott Reed. So in the meantime, give us a shout out on social media if you like what you heard and take care. Till next week, Chris Ball, love you, brother. <laughs>